This episode goes out to Derek in Hooker Valley, New Zealand. You do you, Derek. Hi there, Megan Robinson here. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast, Season 2. Did you miss me last week? I missed you too. But I'm back, and I want to remind you that we've got a deal on Underrealm Books for the holidays. It's sort of my Christmas duty. Hehe, <laughs> duty. Anyway, right now, if you use the coupon code HOLIDAY on checkout at underrealm.net slash books, you can get free shipping on any of the Underrealm books in print. It's the perfect way to fill those empty spots under the tree and give a fantastic gift to a fantasy reader in your life. Just go to underrealm.net slash books, pick up any of the amazing fantasy books we've got for sale, and use the holiday coupon code at checkout. If you're in the United States, your order will come signed by Garrett Robinson himself, and you'll pay exactly zero for shipping. It's a perfect holiday miracle. Again, that's underrealm.net slash books. And don't forget to use the coupon code HOLIDAY on checkout. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today you're getting Chapter 8 of Mystic. When we left off, Lauren had reunited with Annis, and together with the wizard Zane, they were heading south to the town of Redbrook. Enjoy! Mystic, Chapter 8 the day passed, and after nightfall their horses picked their careful way through moonslight. Though the travelers looked often over their shoulders, they never saw any sign of Jordel or Seth behind them. Zane made them press on through the night, though he did let the horses slow to a walk. When dawn came, they increased their pace once again, and so passed another long, tense day of riding. Still they saw no sign of pursuit neither from the mystic nor the army at their backs. Mayup, the army found them, and they are embattled, said Jem as they paused for lunch on the second day. Mayup, said Lauren. She hoped not. Though she had no wish to ride beside the mystic, neither did she wish him harm. Zane said nothing. By the second day's end, Lauren nearly slept in her saddle, and she had to jostle Annis again and again to keep the girl mounted. Zane kept one arm wrapped tight around Jem as they rode, for the boy's head lolled back and forth as the horse slowed and sped. He looked like a puppet dangling on a limp string. But Zane himself looked exhausted, and more than once he almost let Jem spill to the ground. As the sun neared the horizon, Lauren pulled her mount to a stop, letting the river flow idly around the horse's hocks. We must rest, for the children's sake. They cannot go on like this forever, nor can you, nor can I. Zane blinked hard as he looked at her, and his lids rose slower than normal. The mystic will not stop, not if I know his kind. He has ridden slower than us, I tell you. He had to, or risk passing our trail when we left the river. Zane blinked again and looked down, confused. We are still in the river. That settles it, she said, rolling her eyes. Find your way to land, wizard. Your wits are addled. She put action to words by seizing the reins of his horse and spurring her own forwards until they reached dry land. Only for a few hours, insisted Zane. Agreed, said Lauren. I am tired, not eager to be found. Jem only woke enough to keep from tumbling from the saddle, and as soon as Zane lowered him to the ground, he lay upon the grass and slept. Annis dismounted more demurely, taking the time to hobble her horse and fasten its reins to the branches of a willow that stooped over the water. Then she, too, lay upon the ground and fell to slumber without unpacking her bedroll. She curled herself next to Jem, her head resting against his shoulder. The boy slept on, heedless. Lauren saw Zane sway on his feet and sighed. You are nearly dead with weariness, she said. 
I will take the first watch and wake you after two hours have passed. There is no need, said Zane. He raised his eyes. They glowed fire white in the darkness. Lauren saw nothing else, but she heard it, a faint whispering in the wind. And she felt it, a brush against her cheek, a murmur running along her skin. The glow left Zane's eyes slowly, dimming to nothing. After a moment, the sound and feeling passed. Lauren suppressed a hard shiver. What sorcery was that? Zane grunted. A spell of warding. A wall of air now stands around us. It will not bar a determined attack, but a blow upon it will pull me from even the deepest sleep. None will come upon us without warning. A fire mage has more uses than simple flame, it seems. Awe made Lauren forget her weariness for a moment. If you have such tricks, why do you fear the mystic? What harm could he offer you? Zane scowled. I told you he does not mean to kill me, nor to maim. The mystics may yet be terrible when they go to war, but greater still is the danger of their velvet tongues. They spin lies as a weaver does cloth, and their schemes stretch beyond the most ambitious plots of kings and merchants. If you find yourself within their web of intrigue, you are not likely to escape it. Lauren gulped as her throat grew dry and her fingers strayed to her dagger. Zane followed the movement, and his gaze grew hard as it met hers. But he spoke no word, instead turning to pull his bedroll from the saddle. She thought she might sleep uneasily, but the moment Lauren's head hit the ground, her world faded to blackness. When next her eyes opened, it was to a bright blue sky and an urgent hand on her shoulder. "'Wake up,' said Jem. "'We have all of us overslept, it seems, "'though I hold the wizard most to blame. "'A mind such as mine needs its rest.' "'Lauren stood, sleep banished from her head in an instant. "'She found Zane furiously throwing his bedroll into his saddlebag, "'every movement sharp, angry. "'Your barrier,' said Lauren. "'Is it breached?' "'It stands undisturbed,' said Zane. They have not yet found us, but they could be upon our very heels. Dawn has long since passed. Lauren looked up to see the sun several fingers above the hilltops. She could not believe she had slept so long, and yet they had gone a long while without enough rest. Now there was nothing for it. They must ride on and hope for the best. In moments they had mounted, and now Zane pushed their steeds to the limit. Even running in the cool river water, soon Lauren's horse burned beneath her and a thick lather formed on its flanks. Its breath came harsh and gasping from flared nostrils. How long can the horses run like this? she called out. You said yourself they are no good if they die beneath us. Long enough, I hope, said Zane. Today we should reach the water town of Redbrook. There we will trade horse for boat. Lauren took some heart in that. She was used to the open road, a wide country and a clear sky above, but when fleeing from pursuit, she thought she would rather be within the walls of a city, where there were buildings and rooftops aplenty on which to hide. Zane had guessed well. Long before Lauren thought to ask for lunch, they spotted a black streak crouching on the horizon. As they rode ever southwards, the streak became a long stretch of squat buildings, peaking above a derelict wall made here of stone, there of wooden spikes. The wall and the buildings both had the look of an afterthought, as though the ramshackle constructions had been erected in some curious blend of haste and laziness by whoever happened to wander by them each day. As they got closer still, Lauren saw the river they had followed join with a much larger one, which ran on until it passed through the center of the town that lay before them. Zane let the horses slow to a trot as they finally left the river and made for the road. As they drew nearer to the walls, the horses slowed to a walk, and Zane spoke as if making a proclamation. The Town of Redbrook an outpost of Selvin in name, but peopled by a lazy and unambitious folk. Still, they have their charm, and they do not ask many questions of travelers, for they see them aplenty. Nor are they overly fond of mystics, 
a quality I often admire, and never more so than now. Lauren studied the town, so much smaller and quainter than Cabras, grander than her own village in the Birchwood, and utterly unlike either place in appearance or manner. They approached the walls and stopped before a single wooden gate that swung open instead of drawing up. Its bottom rested deep in the mud, and looked as though it had not moved in months. A single old guard sat watch, leaning heavily on a pike. Lauren saw a wineskin resting beneath his chair. "'Who goes there?' called the guard as they approached. Zane spoke for them. "'Travelers from Cabris, seeking passage east along the river for Wavemount. "'A pretty young family, if you do not mind my saying so,' said the guard. Lauren blushed as she realized he took her for Zane's wife. But did he think her the mother of Jem and Annis, with Lauren's young age and the dark skin of both children?' Lauren looked again at the wineskin beneath the guard, and she wondered how many others the man had had already today. Zane, meanwhile, proved the picture of courtesy. "'My thanks. May the sun warm your brow and the river cool your toes.' They rode through the gates with no further word, the guard giving a single bleary nod as they passed. Lauren felt a twinge of guilt as she remembered the army of sellswords to the north. Jordell had thought it likely that they made for Wellmont or one of the other western cities, but he mentioned they might march on Redbrook. What if that were true? From what she could see of this town, they would be utterly unprepared for war at their doorstep. Every building seemed to lean. It did not make them seem weak or rickety, so much as relaxed and waiting for some moment of excitement. She imagined each building, every house and inn, as a farmer resting his forearms upon a fence post while watching the sun's march through the sky. The people matched their homes, most sitting or standing in positions of lazy rest. Their clothing varied in tone only between the dark brown of dyed wool and the lighter shade of dry burlap, and many wore hats woven of river reeds. Those walking the streets moved without hurry, and often Lauren had to slow her horse to keep from trampling them underfoot. Outsiders within the town were easy to spot. They moved more quickly, their faces bearing signs of purpose as they wove their way between the uncaring locals. "'What in the world is wrong with them?' wondered Jem out loud. "'Even the children move like old men!' This town has not seen battle for many generations, said Zane. No other kingdom has made true war upon Selvin in centuries, and Redbrook has no wealth to make itself the target of a border skirmish with Dorsey. Even Selvin scarcely remembers they are here. Day in and day out, these people fish, farm the lands around, and spend their days with their families. After a time, it is easy to forget that any troubles plague the outside world. The wizard seemed to hold some contempt for the simple folk, and Jem looked horrified. But Lauren felt a calm settle upon her as she walked the streets, and she found it hard to mind very much that Jordell and Seth still pursued them. She caught herself nodding and smiling at each passerby as they did the same, and soon felt at peace in their company. A thought came in a flash. Aside from her parents, Lauren's own village in the Birchwood felt very much the same as this town. Nothing moved too quickly, nor did anyone speak too loud. Life simply went on, as it always had, and always would. And here her father's meaty fists did not threaten her. For just a moment, Lauren thought that she could have stayed for a while in Redbrook, and might even have been happy. But such thoughts were madness. A mystic haunted her footsteps, and behind him, an army. "'We must make for the river,' said Zane. "'There we will find a boat to take us east along the dragon's tail until it meets the sea. There a ship can take us to Wavemount in the east, to wait for a while until our heads are less sought after by—' He looked around, as though suddenly cautious of being overheard. "'Well, less sought after in general.' The river did not lie far away, and the street carried them straight towards it. Soon Lauren heard the gurgling of water again. This time it came stronger, swelling on the air like a choir. 
and when they reached the water, she saw why. This river stretched far, far wider than the one they had followed south, wider even than the Melnar by the Birchwood back home. Lauren had never seen so much water all in one place, and suddenly she looked with distrust upon the stone bridges that spanned its width. But even as she stood in awe at the river's great size, Annis yelped with fright and seized Lauren's reins. The girl kicked her horse hard, guiding both mounts down a side street. Zane cried out and followed, swerving when Annis ducked between an inn and a smithy, where their horses came to a sudden stop in the deep mud that lined all the streets of the town. "'Stay out of sight,' said Annis. "'It is an agent of my family. My cousin, I think, though distant. His name is something ridiculous, like Fortinbras. In a flash, Lauren dismounted and moved to the mouth of the alley, leaning around the edge to look back at the main thoroughfare. From the bridge stepped a small procession of horses and men on foot. At their head rode a tall man, his skin as dark as Annis's, hair close-cropped and flecked with gray. Unlike Annis or Damaris, or any member of the family Aaron that Lauren had yet seen, this man was fat. He draped himself in garish silks and fine clothes that looked more ostentatious than fancy, and he laughed too loud and too long. But it was not the merchant that drew Lauren's eye, nor the warriors riding before and behind him who were clearly bodyguards, nor did she look upon the small train of followers behind the man, tittering at his every laugh and looking furtively at him from behind long eyelashes. Instead, Lauren looked upon the woman who rode at the merchant's side. The woman sat short and slender in her saddle, and her horse was sized to match. Fortinbras' charger towered above the smaller horse, and the merchant must have stood two heads taller than the woman. But beside him, the woman was like a dagger of pure steel next to an ornamental greatsword. The greatsword, though bedecked in gold and jewels, had little purpose beyond display while the dagger was meant for swift and deadly deeds in the night. So seemed the woman. Her eyes and hair were dark, her skin fair enough to seem ghostly. She reminded Lauren of Bracken's tales of elves, ethereal creatures who lived beyond the ken of men. And about her shoulders hung a deep red cloak, its hood thrown back, clasped at her throat with a silver pin. Lauren could not see its design from so far away, but she would have wagered everything she owned that it was the badge of a mystic. Even as Lauren took all of this in and began to sweat along the back of her neck at the knowledge, the mystic woman turned to look at her. It was as though she knew Lauren lurked in the shadows and watched her and knew what dwelt in Lauren's mind besides. Their eyes met across the long distance, and Lauren blanched under the mystic's gaze. Then the procession moved on, and the mystic vanished from sight. Lauren, freed from the stair, stepped back into the alley with a long sigh of relief and leaned against the smithy's wall. What? said Zane. What did you see? You will not like the sound of it. I saw Annis's kinsman, and I do not think we need fear him much, but at his side rides a mystic, and I would rather not guess at her purpose here. She saw me. Zane sucked a sharp breath between his teeth. Did she recognize you? Did she know your face? Of course not, said Lauren, scoffing. How could she? Word could not have come from Jordale so quickly, nor do I think he would have sent any. It is not Jordel who worries me, but the merchant Damaris, said Zane. That is a wiser worry, said Annis. My mother would have sent word to all our clan as quickly as riders could carry it. They may well know of your look and be wary to spot you, thinking we travel together. They would be right to think so, Lauren pointed out. But as I said already, the merchant was not the one who saw me. Would your family work in league with the mystics and tell them to look for me as well? Annis thought hard. I do not know for certain, but it seems unlikely. We have dealings with the mystics, but they are generally far too nosy for my family's liking. Then I doubt the mystic knows to look for me, or for you. 
In any case, she took little notice of me, though even so little seemed too much. Lauren shivered despite her cloak and the day's ample heat. At last it seems you learn wisdom in dealing with their kind, said Zane. We would do well to move on. I have no wish to work against the agents of your family and the mystics at once. A clever foe is hard enough to outwit, and two may be impossible. After checking once more to ensure the merchant's retinue had passed, he led them out of the alley and back to the main street. They turned left and rode their horses slowly across the bridge. The crossing allowed Lauren to forget her momentary fright at the sight of the mystic, and she marveled to see the high arches of the bridge, which rose so far above the water. When she first left the birchwood and chased Zane south towards Cabras, she had crossed a simple stone bridge that spanned the Melnar. She remembered marveling at its size and construction then, but the bridge she rode on now was many times greater. It made her curious as to what wondrous sights there were to see across Underrealm, and when she might see them. A sudden wanderlust gripped her feet, and she felt an urge to spur her horse to a gallop, to lead it south out of Redbrook and west along the King's Road until she passed through each of the nine lands in turn, seeing all the strange sights and people they had to offer. Then the moment passed, and she remembered Jem and Annis beside her, and Zane riding ahead with his shoulders hunched over his saddle horn. Wild thoughts and unmet goals were all well and good for daydreams, but now she must keep her wits about her, or she risked everything. On the other side of the river, Zane led them down a row of low, flat riverboats. Lauren saw how the river had been rimmed with great stone walls and wooden stairs and platforms built all along them so that smaller boats could be lashed for embarkation. Zane rode swift and sure to a small bucket of a vessel at one of the docks. The thing did not look as though it could carry more than five people. Lauren wondered how the four of them would fit upon it along with the crew. Zane dismounted and bade them tie their horses to a nearby post. Then he took them down the steps to the platform where the boat rested, and without asking permission, he stepped on board. No sooner did his boot strike the deck than Lauren heard a stirring from below. Moments later, a man burst out onto the deck. He stood far shorter than Lauren, scarcely a head taller than Annis, but his ample girth made him seem taller. Two days of beard clung to his chin, and his heavy eyebrows seemed all the more severe as they drew together in a scowl. But that scowl lasted only a moment as he cast eyes upon Zane, and then wide brown lips cracked in a smile to reveal yellowed and bent teeth. Sky above! What is that face doing in this piss pod of a town? he barked. Zane, what in the Nine Lands has brought you here? I cannot imagine it is good, or you would have found a prettier face to rest your eyes upon. And Zane, dour Zane, solemn Zane who had rarely shown Lauren anything more than a glare, a frown, an exasperated roll of his eyes, Zane laughed heartily and loud and leaped forwards to meet the captain, throwing his arms around the shorter man and hoisting his heels off the ground in greeting. Brimlad, I would have feared I might not find you here, had you ever shown a spark of talent that might have brought you anywhere else. The captain laughed and slammed his hands against Zane's back, and then held the wizard at arm's length to look up at his face. Redbrook is good enough for this old man, but you? I thought you were holed up in some noble's mansion on the High King's seat. Zane cleared his throat sudden and loud, throwing a quick glance over his shoulder at Lauren, Jem, and Annis. Brimlad closed his mouth with a clack of teeth and looked at them. You have brought friends, I see, and I would guess that means you are not here to visit. You guess aright, said Zane, but that is a story for when we are on the open water and well away from prying eyes and ears. We need transport, and an hour from now would not seem too soon. Brimlad scoffed, drawing back and folding his arms. 
An hour? How much trouble are you in, boy? Even a salt dog has a reputation to uphold, and I am no such scoundrel. I could not leave my clients and expect to find any more when I come back. I have thirty weights sitting in my pocket that will keep me here until tomorrow evening. Can you match them? Zane's face fell, and he turned to the others behind him. No, not unless at utmost need. As I thought, said Brimlad, and in that case you will have to hole up somewhere until then. I would offer you a bunk below, but I fear I cannot take all four of you. I hope you can take one more upon the morrow, Captain. The voice behind them almost made Lauren leap overboard with fright. She whirled to the wooden dock along the stone river wall to find the slender mystic standing beside the merchant from the family Yaren. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R dot com. Today's letter is N. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.